Our next faculty speaker is Bree Aldrich. Bree is an assistant professor of molecular biology and microbiology at the Sackler School of Graduate Biomedical Sciences. She also has an appointment in the School of Engineering. And it's really exciting for me personally that I've gotten to know Bree because she's heard me tell this story. The first time I was ever in the provost's office was because there were two deans and a provost trying to figure out how to make this amazing, how to create a deal that would get this incredible young scholar to choose Tufts. I'm glad to say that we were successful to get her here. Now, you might think, given the work that Bree does, that she was always someone into math and science. Not so. But she did find her way into this area after working on mathematical modeling, find her way in the life sciences. And it's that unique combination of skills and interests that I think has led her lab to do innovative work and pathbreaking work on tuberculosis. So um, I have to say, we, we had a challenge in New York because Bree had laryngitis, but she struggled through, did a great job. We're happy to have full voice here tonight, but I was worried for a moment we were going to lose Bree because she heard that the WHO was in town, but uh, we still have her. I think your facts are a little wrong, because I heard it wasn't the WHO that was in town, but actually the who <laughs> is staying in the hotel. Um, and I'm not quite of the who generation, although I think it depends on how I part my hair, on how much gray, gray you see here. But I am a big fan of the WHO. So WHO recently did a new report about tuberculosis just a few months ago. And they had pretty bad news about TB. So they now consider TB to be the leading cause of death in the world due to a single infectious agent the single leading cause of death in the world due to a single infectious agent. So now they believe TB deaths overtake HIV, AIDS death, and malaria death. Most people don't realize how prevalent TB still is in the world. They believe that a third of the world is in latently infected with TB. 10 million people are sickened every year. And last year, at least 1.5 million people died of TB. To put this in perspective, one and a half million people is the population of Manhattan, and almost two and a half times the population of the city of Boston. We lack many critical tools we need to, to tackle TB. Um, and these tools include fast-acting therapies. Even if you get TB here in the United States, you're going to be on a course of four different antibiotics for at least six months. Most infections are treated with antibiotics for only 10 days. So six months is an incredibly long period of time. If you have drug-resistant TB, your therapy is going to be much longer and inv involve much harsher antibiotics. You'll be on drugs for at least two years, and hopefully you'll be cured. We lack rapid diagnostics. We lack effective vaccines. And we also lack the identification of biomarkers or measurable molecules that will help us identify the different states of individuals of their disease. So my lab uses simple but really powerful tools to try and shorten TB therapy. But I want to spend a couple minutes telling you about TB first. What is TB? TB is a disease caused by infection with a bacterium called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It spreads by aerosols. So when an individual with active disease coughs, they release the bacterium into the air and neighboring people can inhale it and become um, infected. One interesting feature of TB, and actually what made me really interested in the problem, was how much variability there is with TB. So recall that I told you a third of the world is infected with TB. Of infected individuals, about 10% will go on over the course of their lifetime to acquire active disease. And those are the individuals that are sick and then become contagious. So what this 10% means to me is that the host immune response, the human, actually usually does a pretty good job of holding the infection back. The human normally wins in most cases. Um, and we also see variability not only in how this pathogen interacts with the human host, but how the, the pathogen itself responds to drug treatment. All right, so how does this variability occur? What is this sort of variability that I'm talking about at the single cell level? So if you take any population of cells or any population of bacteria and you treat them with a stressor, whether it's the host immune response or whether it's antibiotics, you're going to see that some cells respond quickly and succumb to the stress. And other cells take either a longer period of time or more stressor in order to die. This variability 
is the root of why drug treatment is so arduous and why it requires so many drugs for such a long period of time. Um, one interesting feature of this, however, is that when someone undergoes TB therapy, they, most of the bacteria is killed in the first two weeks of treatment. So what is different about the bacteria that require an extra five and a half months of treatment from the bacteria that are killed very quickly? These are the bacteria that we really need to understand more about. So I came to the TB field from an unlikely um, background. I was trained as a computer engineer and then a cancer cell biologist. And when I started to learn more about TB, I realized there was a lot more parallels between infections like TB and cancer than I once realized, namely that both diseases require extensive periods of time on drug treatment with multiple drugs. And the reason why they require this is because at each treatment, only a subpopulation of cells are killed. So when I started my lab and when I started researching TB, I, I asked this, the simplest question one could possibly ask, what is different about bacteria that are easy to kill from bacteria that are hard to kill? And in order to do this, we need to look at single cells. So my lab uses microscopes, and we watch cells grow. And what we're, <laughs> that sounds really simple, I know. <laughs> it's really hard to do. <laughs> uh, what we're looking for are cells that are hardest to kill with antibiotics. So we treat them with antibiotics, and then we use image analysis and computation to help decipher what is different about the bacteria that are killed quickly from the bacteria that aren't killed quickly. One thing that we do with our experimental setup is use microfluidic devices and a controlled environmental chamber around our microscope to ensure that the environment of all the bacteria are exactly the same so we can concentrate on differences among individual cells in our population. All right, and this is what we see. This is a movie of two sister cells growing. And I want you to see is that the cells are not dividing in the middle and that they're growing at very different rates. Now, these two sisters used to be one before this movie started, right? So they're closely related to each other, but they're acting completely different from each other. This looks very different from other rod-shaped bacteria that other labs commonly study, like E. coli. Those cells grow at the same rate, all of the cells grow the same way, and they all divide in the middle. They don't look all wonky the way mycobacteria do. We wondered how this could happen. What we did is we stained the outside of the cells, and then we watched them grow, and you can see the little red tips coming from the cells are only growing from the old pole, one pole of the cell. What this tells us is that the cells are growing asymmetrically from only the old side. And this asymmetric growth means that when a cell grows and then divides into two daughter cells, the two daughter cells are not the same. One inherits the growth pole from the mom. This cell grows faster and is born larger than its little sister. All right. The really important part of this is that these two cells have different growth characteristics and differential tolerance to antibiotic treatment. So some classes of antibiotics kill the fast growing cells better and other classes of antibiotics kill the slow growing cells better. This asymmetric growth pattern also creates other kinds of differences in what is otherwise a genetically identical population of cells. So on the face of it, and the way a lot of labs would study these cells, they look exactly the same, but they're behaving differently. Um, and so what we're seeking to do now is to quantify differences in these cells and then use mathematics to help us understand really what makes up, what does a drug tolerant cell look like so we can target those cells and kill them more effectively. We do this by starting in a special laboratory for biosafety. So what I'm showing you here is some of the work we were doing in the level three laboratory at the School of Medicine, just I guess not even a mile down the road from here. Um, and this specialized laboratory allows us to work with pathogens that um, are dangerous in the air. And we load them into these microfluidic devices that you can see here. And the microfluidic device means that we can keep the cells growing for extended periods of time. Mycobacteria are slow-growing bacteria, so it's important that we keep them well-fed and happy throughout the course of the movies. We use fluorescent markers and stains, and we look at basic measurements like how large the cells are and what the timing of division is. And this allows us to basically make a compendium of parameters or factors that describe each individual cell. This includes their response to drug, and we feed all of these factors into mathematical models and use mathematical models then to help us 
decipher or to clarify differences between drug susceptible and drug tolerant mycobacteria. A very important feature of our work and something that's critical to our success is the ability to find new analytic tools from the physical sciences and from engineering and port them in to apply to our biological system. And that's because the physical sciences and tools in engineering are very good at clarifying complexity and that's exactly what we have in the new era of biology. We then iterate between the engineering approaches, the modeling approaches, um, and the experiments to continue to refine our understanding of what's different about the bacteria that are hardest to kill so that we can try and target these cells. This intersection of engineering and biology <laughs> um, is also um, the focus of kind of a new era of interdisciplinary science and how we're training new scientists um, at Tufts. And it's one of the reasons why I was attracted to Tufts because of all the energy and enthusiasm for using infectious diseases like TB as a way for us to really innovate new tools. Um, one, part of the dawn of the new sciences is that we have new techniques and approaches that we can use and apply them and develop new tools to pathogens instead of just model systems. Um, and it is really attractive to students. And what we're trying to generate is a group of scientists that are really prepared to go out into the world understanding how to navigate the new era of interdisciplinary science. I mean, my lab in particular is made up of microbiologists, immunologists, engineers, um, and mathematicians. And it's really exciting to see these groups of students and postdocs and scholars working together. So what is the outlook? It takes a while, um, and the mycobacteria are growing slowly. But we are making progress in learning what is different about slowly killed mycobacteria from the quickly killed mycobacteria. And my hope is that we can refine these descriptions and eventually use them to shorten treatment so that we won't be stuck for another four decades with a six-month-long multiple drug TB regimen. <laughs>